Welcome to Heart to Heart Nurses, brought to you by the Preventive Cardiovascular Nurses Association. PCNA's mission is to promote nurses as leaders in cardiovascular disease prevention and management. Welcome to today's episode, the second of a three-episode miniseries on pulmonary hypertension. Our previous episode looked at recognizing pulmonary hypertension, and today we're going to be exploring the next step in the journey of a patient with PH, the diagnosis. To help us learn more about this topic, we're talking today with Dr. Furhan Raza from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Raza, could you please introduce yourself? Thank you for inviting me, uh, Gerald, and I'm delighted to join you today. Um, I'm a pulmonary hypertension and heart failure cardiologist at University of Wisconsin in Madison. I've been practicing PH for nearly 10 years and have been at UW-Madison for over four years now. Um, since arriving here, I've started a exercise physiology invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test lab. We do participate in multi-center clinical trials and have a PHA accredited center. We also have uh, uh, quite a few uh, internal research studies in vascular mechanics and myocardial bio, uh, biology here at UW. I suspect that our audience can tell already that Dr. Raza is an expert at PH, and we're very excited to have him on the program today. I'm hoping that we might be able to start with a, a global view of things. That Dr. Raza, the World Health Organization, or WHO, has described five different groups of pulmonary hypertension. Could you shed for us some light on those five groups? Uh, Yes, PH is a very diverse disease. It nearly affects 1% of uh, global population, Um, hence the need to uh, create this classification. The five uh, groups that WHO created um, do represent five different types of diseases. So uh, we call them uh, WHO or WHO groups. So WHO group one involves uh, patients who have some type of pulmonary arterial hypertension. It includes idiopathic patients, patients who develop pH due to connective tissue disease like scleroderma. Um, Some of the other common causes are portal hypertension and uh, HIV infections and drug toxicity. Who group two um, is the most common type that occurs due to some type of left heart disease, and that could be a diverse group of diseases in themselves in the form of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction, sometimes related to heart valve disease like mitral valve or aortic valve disease. And then who group three is related to some type of lung disease that triggers hypoxia. This could be uh, common things like COPD, interstitial lung disease, obstructive sleep apnea comes under the same category. And then who group four um, is a very peculiar type of pulmonary hypertension due to thromboembolic disease. A uh, more common word that we use is CDEF for who group four, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And the last group is who group five, which is uh, kind of a basket for a lot of different diseases that don't belong in any other group. So this could be a multifactorial group of diseases the more prominent ones that come in this category are kidney failure patients who may be on dialysis and then some other common hematological uh, blood disorders like polycythemia vera come under this group as well. That is quite an extensive list of diseases that are classified into these five WHO groups. Might there be a more simplified approach to these five groups? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it These groups do give us uh, appreciation for the diversity of uh, pH patients that we deal with. Um, But thankfully, there is a very um, um, simplified approach of thinking of pulmonary hypertension as either one of the two um, bigger problems. So the first one, um, you could uh, call it more uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension uh, pathology where the disease is starting in the pulmonary vasculature in the pulmonary arteries or arterioles and that creates high pressure and resistance in the pulmonary circulation. Um, we do call this uh, pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension as well and then the second category um, are related to some type of uh, heart disease. Um, one could use the words congestive heart failure for those group of diseases or pulmonary venous hypertension or post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. So uh, most of the WHO group diseases fall in either one of these two categories, either um, more of a pulmonary arterial problem with pulmonary arterial hypertension-like disease 
or a congestive heart failure like disease. Could you describe for us or elaborate on how you talk to patients who have these two different types of pulmonary hypertension? That's a very uh, good question. Also, um, a, a lot of times it can be quite challenging for patients to navigate um, how come they have pulmonary hypertension, uh, but um, they may know somebody else who has pulmonary hypertension who may be on very different treatments to what uh, treatment suits them. So the way I describe to patients is um, this: um, uh, what I briefly described before. Um, that they may have one or the other type of pulmonary hypertension. For example, if I'm dealing with a patient who has pulmonary arterial hypertension, I will um, describe to them that they truly have damage to their lung blood vessels. They will benefit from um, different treatments, uh, different drugs that help lower the resistance or pressure in their blood ves- pulmonary blood vessels. And they may need additional workup for uh, autoimmune disease or Uh, blood clot problems uh, in their lung blood vessels, if uh, that is relevant to them. So I'll have that type of conversation with a patient who has pulmonary arterial hypertension. For the second type of patient who may have essentially um, congestive heart failure, I will actually use that word to describe to them that that is their primary problem. Um, and that is care for their heart disease in the form of uh, underlying problems. They may be facing coronary disease, Um, atrial fibrillation, heart valve problems, and I'll let them know that they do have some type of pulmonary hypertension, but it is a secondary problem. Their primary issue is congestive heart failure. We've been discussing pulmonary hypertension and its diagnosis, and we're going to take a quick break. We will be right back. For more education, resources, and tools for your clinical practice, visit pcna.net. You'll find CE courses, patient handouts, and more, all free to access. Visit PCNA.net. We're back with Dr. Raza to continue our discussion about the diagnosis of a patient with pulmonary hypertension. And I'm hoping we could spend a little bit of time talking about right heart catheterization. What is that exactly? Very commonly, um, if we think about the journey that a pulmonary hypertension patient goes through, um, the patient themselves have been experiencing uh, shortness of breath or inability to exercise for um, for quite a long period of time till they actually seek care through their primary care doctor. Um, at some point along the way, they get an echocardiogram, which is the ultrasound of the heart that picks up pulmonary hypertension in most of the cases as the uh, as a screening test. Um, and in some selective cases, um, the, the, the physicians who are involved in the care of the patient, they decide to confirm the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension through this invasive test. Um, so that's essentially what a right heart catheterization is. It is an invasive test, and uh, it allows um, pulmonary hypertension physicians to simultaneously confirm pressures in uh, pulmonary arteries and estimate pressures inside the uh, uh, pressures on the left side of the heart and, um, first of all, uh, confirm that if uh, the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension is correct, uh, but more importantly, they can identify which type of pulmonary hypertension the patient has. Could you describe for us how the procedure is done and also what a patient should expect when they come in for that particular test? Yes. Um, So uh, the procedure is done uh, most commonly in this part of a hospital, uh, which is labeled as heart catheterization or cardiac catheterization lab. Um, It is pretty standard in most most centers. When the patient comes in, they are notified ahead of time just to be fasting overnight. Um, And then they arrive in this part of the hospital where they um, are welcomed by most commonly a nurse. Um, and make sure um, they don't have any kind of acute illness that should, or, or any um, concern for bleeding that will uh, um, create some risk for the procedure. Once all of that is checked in, the patient is moved to a procedure room, um, and um, most commonly a cardiologist or heart doctor will um, start off by um, placing a catheter or a tube in um, in in um, some specific part of the body. So we call it an access site for the catheter. Um, very commonly, it can be um, the site in the groin or in the, in the neck uh, where the jugular vein is. 
uh, more recently uh, we've been doing some of these procedures through um, through a vein in the arm as well we call it brachial vein so uh, one of those three options tend to be the most common sites when it comes to um, access site um, the next aspect of this procedure is really the the length of the procedure so it roughly takes somewhere between um, 15 to 30 minutes but a lot of time is spent before the procedure in the in the preparation um, some some centers do use some sedative for this test as well so patients are comfortable and relaxed um, but but not all centers do that um, and very frequently expert centers like ourselves try to think of some provocative maneuver um, that is generally done after um, some of the heart and lung pressures are assessed. So these provocative maneuvers um, may vary. So most common one that is done in pulmonary hypertension patients is uh, inhaled uh, vasodilator drug. So nitric oxide is used in most centers. Prostacycline is also used in some other centers. Um, so that is a very common thing done in pulmonary hypertension patients to check if they're um, lung pressures decrease um, in, 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 in the short term when this uh, inhaled drug is given in the cath lab. Um, some other centers, including us, do perform exercise testing as well in selective cases when people come in for a right heart catheterization. Um, so, um, so that is generally achieved through some type of a stationary bike in, in either upright position or a supine position. And then the, the last thing I'll mention on the topic of provocative maneuver is in, especially in patients who have some type of congestive heart failure, um, they are given sometimes a slightly different type of uh, um, drug um, called nitroprusside, and that attempts to normalize the heart pressures um, and also the blood pressure to see um, how, um, how how the heart and lung pressures may behave. So you've described three different ways that you might have these provocative maneuvers. Does the length of the test vary based on whether or not you're using some of these other maneuvers? That's an excellent question. Yes. So um, as I described, the actual procedure for the right heart cat may not take more than 15 minutes in most cases. Uh, but if you do add on one of these provocative maneuvers, that can add another 15, 20 minutes of, uh, of, of the procedure time. For example, inhaled nitric, which is used very commonly in pulmonary hypertension patients, um, it, it, based on the um, protocol by guidelines, the inhaled nitric should run um, roughly up to 10 minutes. Um, so after after 10 minutes of the medication used, then you have to repeat the uh, check of these pressures and blood flow. Um, so that adds on at least 15 minutes of procedure time, if not longer. So what types of information or results are you seeking? So the right heart catheterization provides uh, essentially uh, two key pieces of information. Uh, one is related to the pressures, and the second piece of information is related to blood flow, we call cardiac output. And then the third piece that we actually calculate from these two um, pieces of information is resistance across the lung blood vessels. Um, so if we um, re reference and review the recent guidelines from European Society of Cardiology and European Respiratory Society that were published in 2022, the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension is based on mean pulmonary arterial pressure. So if the mean pulmonary arterial pressure at rest is more than 20 millimeters of mercury, that actually is the gold standard definition of pulmonary hypertension. So that is the first piece of information that we um, are paying attention to. The second piece of information is related to um, an estimate of pressure on the left side of the heart. So through a heart catheterization, we essentially assess um, uh, this one specific pressure we call pulmonary artery wedge pressure. And that is a way for us to estimate the pressure um, on the left side of the heart, specifically left atrium, um, and essentially uh, within the left ventricle at the end of diastole. So the cutoff that is used in the pulmonary hypertension guidelines for pulmonary artery wedge pressure is 15. For example, if your wedge pressure is 15 or lower, that will be um, normal. But once the wedge pressure is more than 15, for example, 16 or higher, then um, the patients will have uh, some type of left heart disease. And that's something we have to take into clinical context. 
Um, but that is the second pressure that can really help us guide if we're dealing with a patient who either has pulmonary arterial hypertension with a wedge pressure equal to or less than 15, or we're dealing with a patient with congestive heart failure with a wedge pressure of 16 or higher. And then the third piece uh, related to resistance, uh, specifically we uh, uh, define it as pulmonary vascular resistance. And the cutoff we previously have been using um, for pulmonary arterial hypertension has been more than three, and Woods units is the is the unit that we use. Um, however, in 22, uh, 2022 guidelines by ESC and ERS, that cutoff for pulmonary vascular resistance has been dropped from three to two. Um, so PVR more than two would be consistent with uh, precapillary pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary arterial hypertension, while uh, PVR um, equal to or less than two will be consistent with um, some type of left heart disease or congestive heart failure. And uh, I will add on one last comment to to to, um, to to that definition. The the motivations and the reasoning behind decreasing the PVR cutoff from three to two is based on uh, quite a lot of interesting epidemiological studies that really indicated um, that once the PVR does start to increase uh, above two, there is a high risk of uh, mortality among pulmonary hypertension patients. So the motivation behind dropping the PBR from three to two is for early identification of disease in these patients. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that I neglected to ask already? Those are uh, those are really, really, um, I think, great, great questions and discussions. I will just add on um, there are a lot of researchers and societal guidelines out there for pulmonary hypertension. Um, I do find the 2022 ESERS guidelines for pulmonary hypertension as an excellent resource. Um, and it's open access, it's available online. Um, ESC and ERS have done a fantastic job of starting off by defining um, what are the normal uh, pressures and blood flow and resistance in normal people. And when um, these metrics start to become abnormal, um, when you one would uh, be labeled with a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, and they do a fantastic job further defining the type of pulmonary hypertension a patient may have, and that leads into um, different treatment pathways as well. So it can be an excellent guide all in one place. We would like to thank our guest, Dr. Raza, for our discussion today about the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. We'd also like to thank Merck, Sharp, and Dome Corporation for their unrestricted grant funding for this episode. This is your host, Geraldine Warfield, and we will see you next time. Thank you for listening to Heart to Heart Nurses. We invite you to visit pcna.net for clinical resources continuing education, and much more.